Okay, so last time uh, we talked about the free central limit theorem, uh, in particular comparing to the classical central limit theorem. Um, yeah, or this was somehow to get an idea of the combinatorics of the formulas for joint moments. And what, what we saw is that in the central limit theorem, uh, the limit distribution, which in an analytic way in the classical case is given by a normal distribution, uh, and in the free case is given by a semicircle, uh, which from an analytic point of view it is not clear why but this should be an analog of this. Uh, on the combinatorial level, this becomes much clearer because uh, what we calculated were the moments in the limit of our central limit theorem, and it turns out that in the classical case, the moments uh, are given by the number of all pairings, and in the free case, they are given by the number of non-crossing pairings. Yeah? And it turns out, somehow, that uh, the, the moments of this guy counts all pairings, and the moments of this guy counts the non-crossing pairings. Huh? So this means, uh, from a commentary point of view, it's much clearer why uh, this and this are analogs. Huh? So in a sense, this is the free version of this. Huh? So we might call this distribution a free normal or free Gaussian distribution, but usually we address it as a semi-structure distribution, huh? because we also show up in some other context in a random matrix theory where usually it is called a semi-structure. It's so important that it really deserves its own name, not just as the free analog of something. Okay, maybe, maybe let me make this as a definition. Uh, so the semi-structure is so important that we sh really should give a name to this object, so we call it a semi-structure element. Um, so if we are in a more commutative space, we can define the uh, non-commutative probability space, or, I mean, as it is clear, those distributions are distributions on the real line, so they are really distributions of self-adjoint elements. Oh, and usually, uh, if I'm talking about a semicircular element, I would like to be the element self-adjoint. Huh? So, let us do the definition in the star probability space, which means we also can take the adjoints, the star of elements, and then we require uh, element or semicircle to be self-adjoint. So we want the self-adjoint random variable variable. So the self-adjoint. Random variable, uh, and usually uh, the, the semicircle are denoted by the letter S. So S and self adjoint means this is a star, an element in our star probability space. So such a random variable is called a uh, semicircular element. Or semicircular random variable, I mean, very often like just an element for random variable. Uh, and the one which we had here had the variance 1. Huh? But of course, I mean, we can scale this. And if I do a central limit theorem and don't assume that my starting variables have the variance 1, but sigma square, then of course, the limit I should get a semicircle of variance sigma square. So let us define it uh, directly in this general situation. So a semicircle element of variance sigma square. Uh, yeah, if the moments are given by essentially counting non-crossing pairings, which are Canada numbers, and if I have a sigma square, of course, uh, I mean I, I should scale it by this. Okay, so this means if it's moments, Uh, and of course, the sigma squared is now the variance of this variable. Uh, in particular, the second moment, 
uh, is just C plus square, because C1 is this one. Also, I have S squared C plus square. Also, C plus square is really the second moment, and because the first moment is zero, it is also the variance. And of course, the one which we had before was the case where sigma squared is equal to 1, and this we will also address as a standard semicircular element. Which is the same as the semicircular element of variance 1. In the case, the sigma squared is equal to 1, uh, we call it the standard semicircular element. Okay, so 
that, that's our notion of convergence. And of course, that's exactly what, what we uh, calculate. Huh? So you see, I mean, now uh, we can, instead of saying that in central limit theorem, the moments of our variables converge uh, to the Catalan numbers or to the number of front person pairings, the moments of the semicircle, we can also say now that our uh, central limit sums converge to a semicircular element. Yeah, because this element has its exactly the most form. Okay, so it's a, it's a matter of, of language, but it's very convenient language. And so let me make a few remarks. A mark about those definitions. So maybe first of all, a semicircular element, we define it by its moments, but of course we already uh, saw, or I told you, that the moments of, of that the Catalan numbers are really the moments of the circular distribution, so really of probability, probability distribution. And, okay, we, we talk about this if sigma squared is equal to 1, and for general sigma squared it's just a scale of this. Also, we should also uh, notice. So the moments of the semicircular element S of variance 1 of variance 1 of the general sigma square uh, are thus given by S squared they are actually the moments of a concrete distribution which is again a semi-circle uh, distribution but scaled by sigma square so 1 over 2 pi and the sigma squared. And then uh, for sigma squared equal to 1, it lifts from minus 2 to plus 2. And now I'm scaling this with sigma. So it's minus 2 sigma times plus 2 sigma. And I have this moment of cos sigma squared minus t squared. So before we had 4 minus t uh, squared, and now we have scaled by sigma squared. So this means the semicircle, which still looks like a semicircle, but the boundary points are now minus 2 sigma and plus 2 sigma. And of course, I mean here I have the corresponding scale. So that the area here is 1, because this is still a probability. Good, so that's uh, the semicircle. And then maybe, let me also make a remark about this notion of convergence in distribution. Uh, because this convergence and distribution, I mean, this is a very kind of as a probabilistic flavor. Huh? That's, that's also what we consider in the classical central limit theorem, uh, that the convergence of random variables really means the convergence of distribution, uh, which essentially means, for example, convergence of moments. Uh, and this is something which gives quite a bit of stochastic flavor to all what we are doing, because we are talking about this kind of convergence, looking on moments. Uh, and this really is a difference uh, from what one usually is doing if, for example, you're dealing with operator algebras, operators in Hilbert spaces. Uh, there we also have a lot of notions of convergence, but those convergence really are convergence which look on how the operator acts in the Hilbert space. Uh, but here we have a different. Uh, so even if our random variables are operators in Hilbert space, we have somehow a different notion of convergence than the one which usually you consider an operator algebra. Uh, and this makes somehow the difference to, to just uh, doing the usual theory of, of operator algebras. Well, and this really is, we are looking on operators, even Hilbert space and operator algebras, we look on them from a more stochastic point of view, by looking on their moments, not on their action in, in the Hilbert space. And so maybe we also uh, write this down. So our convergence. Uh, in distribution um, yeah, so this is a kind of probabilistic uh, concept uh, so this maybe is, of course we are asking more kind of probabilistic questions but from a technical level maybe this is really the real probabilistic concept which, which we are using here, which, which distinguishes it from doing kind of probability
Mystik. And yeah, so even if our random variables are operators from operator algebras, our random variables are operators, operator algebras, uh, so let's say for some bond operators in Hilbert spaces. Then we, there are usually uh, yeah, very different notions of convergence. So then, then our notion of convergence <coughs> or of convergence, so this convergence in distribution, uh, is quite different from the usual ones.
And so, yeah, this shows us that, yeah, for many, yeah, at least for, 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 for the semicircular or the analog of the, of the normal distribution, there's a nice combinatorial uh, description. And actually, uh, this, and, and there's an analogy, analogy between the classical and the free world. Huh? So essentially, if we go over from classical to free, in this situation, we replace the, not the all pairings by the non-crossing pairings. Okay, but this analogy goes even much further. Huh? If it's not just restricted for, for pairings, but actually it's, it also goes over to all partitions. Huh? And in order to see this, maybe I also want to look on more general limit theorems. Huh? In classical probability theory, there's not just a central limit theorem, but there are much more. And maybe, yeah, if we have a limit theorem of classical probability theory, of course we can look on, on, on the free analog of this, huh? replacing independence by freeness, and see what we get. And what we get should, in a sense, be the, the free analog of the corresponding classical distribution. And maybe let me look on another important instance of this, and this is what was under what the name of the law of rare events. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about this. So first of all, so the other important uh, limit theorems. In classical probability theory, about the sum of taking an independent and ident identically distributed uh, random variables so about the sum of I and E also which means I, uh, independent and identically distributed uh, random variables and in particular itself represents rare events. Uh, for example, like the decay of a, of a radioactive uh, atom. Uh, so I mean, it, so if I have one atom, it decays, but not very often. Uh, so but the probability that it decays might be very small. And essentially, I mean, I can have a random variable which just takes on a value 0 or 1. Uh, 0 means it has not decayed, let's say after a given time, within, within one second, for example. 0 means it has not decayed, 1 means it has decayed. And now if I have a, not just, just one atom, but many of them, uh, then of course I mean if I want to, uh, to count how many of them have decayed, then this is the sum of the decay of each of them. Right? Of course you assume that the decay of all the atoms is independent from each other. Uh, so what I have is the sum uh, of all the decays of the individual random variable, of, of the individual atoms. Right? The random variable which describes the individual atom is takes just on the zero, zeros, the value is zero and one. Okay, so, and then the question is, if I have a big number of atoms, what is the typical distribution of, of the number of the decays? Yeah, in this case, I mean, so if mathematically I want to talk about limits, I want to let n go to infinity, but now, I mean, my, my distribution of, of the single summons in my sum are not just scaling like in the central limit theorem. Right? In the central limit theorem, we had independent variables, and if I make n bigger, I just scale each of them by the square root. Oh, okay, so now I cannot scale it if n is making bigger, but for each n I have somehow to choose a different uh, distribution. So what I consider here is essentially the triangle of random variables. N. I have n many, so I have indexed by random variable by first index, which tells me which n I want to consider. So for each n I want to, to sum up n of my variables. So I want to sum this, I want to sum this, I want to sum this, and so on. 
And then I hope that for enlarge this approximate something. And so I mean, I assume that these variables here are independent in each row. Here they are, I have e, and so on. Right? So the next I would have four variables, which I denote by a for one, a for two, a for three, a for, a for four. Right? And, and I want uh, to sum them up. Right? And in each of them, also right? in the end row, this means I'm looking on n atoms, and each of them is the decay probability for one of the atoms. So this is for the first atom, this is for the second, this is for the next, and so on. And then I sum them, and then gives, this gives me the number of the decays uh, which I have seen. Okay, so I assume here, so what, what do I have? So for each n, for each natural number, I assume that I have n random variables, which I denote by, so I put the index n, to say I have n, and then I have n random variables, which are a number from 1 up to n. Oh, okay. And those guys should be I and B. Not the classical context now, not just what we would call a classical theorem. Oh, so they are independent, and they are identically distributed. And of course, I mean, now I have to specify the distribution. Oh, the distribution should be the distribution for decay or not. Oh, so this, each of them. I all, all have the same distribution, and the distribution is just uh, taking on the values 0 and 1. Huh? And of course, 0 with some probability and 1 uh, with some other probability. So, I assume with distribution of each of these A and I, this is given by. Distribution uh, where I'm taking all the value 0 and 1. And of course, the probability for those values is somehow the intensity uh, of my decay. So this is some lambda lambda, let's say. But then, of course, uh, If I want to have a convergence for large n, then of course this could scale somehow with n. So if my average number of decays for n atoms should be con constant, then the decay for one atom should scale with 1 over n. So that all together somehow, if you will say, quantity. Good. Okay, so, so what I uh, came by the distribution, so I say the intensity is lambda, and then divided by n, and then instead of 1, huh? so this is the uh, yeah, direct measure of 1, and then it's minus, 1 minus lambda divided by n, uh, delta 0. Huh? So this means each of them takes on only two values, uh, 1 and 0, and it takes on 1 with the probability lambda divided by n, and with the remaining probability the other one. Okay. And lambda is here the intensity, so this is some parameter. Uh, should be a positive number, uh, and of course, n should be so big that this is more than one, uh, otherwise, it's not a probability. Uh, so, so, for some lambda, uh, positive number. Good, okay, and then I'm interested in taking the sum, so I'm taking for this n, I'm summing the n variables which I have, a and 1 up to a and n, and this converges now, and that's the statement of this uh, law of relevance. I mean, what do you expect? What is the distribution of, of the number of decays of, of, of radiative material? Uh, I mean, that's the Poisson distribution. Okay, so the statement is that this here converges to a Poisson distribution. So then this converges I'm sending n to infinity to a Poisson distribution. Uh, and this Poisson distribution is a parameter, and this parameter is exactly this lambda. So Poisson distribution is uh, 
Lambda. Okay, so what does this mean? Of course, the Poisson distribution also has an explicit uh, formula, which you can write down so that we do this. Uh, but again, as for the, for the normal distribution, this explicit formula for all point of view is it's maybe not, not so important. Okay, but anyway, so let me write it down. Uh, so this means what we are getting here is that an one plus plus n converges. And again, I'm talking about convergent the distribution, so this means that more mass of this converge to a limit guy A, that is A, uh, has a Poisson distribution. And what is a Poisson distribution? A Poisson distribution just takes on as values uh, the, the natural numbers. I mean, it's the sum of variables which take on the value 0 and 1, so the sum can take on just any natural number. Um, and so what is the probability A, let's say, takes on the value P, so P is a natural number of 0, uh, the probability is lambda to P e to the minus lambda divided by P factor for all P in N0. So that's a possible solution, which probably you have seen before, uh, but, but again, it's, it's something I mean, it's, it's important actually because it appears as a limit in such a, a limit theorem. Right? But I mean, maybe after the normal distribution, the Poisson distribution is the most important uh, distribution, the classical theorem. Uh, okay. And again, if you look at the formula, okay, there is some formula for the distribution. Uh, yeah, but what does this mean? Or where does this come from? Uh, and of course, I mean, uh, this e to the minus lambda, of course, normalize it so that this is really a probability distribution. Good. But of course, now, I mean, for us, if we want to make a free analog of this, we should take a setting like this and then just replace independence by free. And then, hopefully, this also converges to something, and then this something is justified to call this a free possible. Oh, okay, but, but so what is this? And then that's something which we want. Uh, to understand the following. So our idea is that if we replace independence by freeness in this setting, uh, then we should converge, and hopefully, that's also something which we have to prove that we converge, uh, but and then the limit object, we would call a free Poisson variable. Poisson distribution. Uh, and of course, we also want to understand what this is. And maybe see also yeah, why is this the analog of this. No? So, again, I mean, on the level of formulas, we cannot expect. I mean, maybe in your end, we find an analytic formula for the free Poisson. But again, probably, I mean, this doesn't give us any hint what the analog would be. No? I mean, if, if I give you the normal distribution and I ask you to maybe guess what is the free analog of this, probably, I mean, you would not come up with the same circle from analytic uh, considerations. And here, again, also this formula doesn't give us any idea what the free analog would be. No? But so what, what we have to do is, of course, to calculate moments in the limit. And this means, first of all, of course, our input are also moments. So I mean, I should also rewrite this here in terms of moments. So what, what are the conditions for the moments of our the variables A and I? So let us first do this. So we have to reformulate the condition on the distribution, condition on the distribution, a and I, which I've given you explicitly, well, the probability of 0 is this and the probability of 1 is this, but actually what we really want are moments, which of course very easy to calculate for this. Uh, so this distribution of moments. Also, so what, what is the, the moment? So I take A and I, and I take, let's say, the arc, the, the arc moment, so what is this? Okay, I mean, 
a and i takes on the value 1 with a probability uh, lambda over n. So with this probability I get 1 to the r. And with the probability 1 minus lambda over n, it takes on a value 0. Oh, so the i moment is 0 to the r. Oh, OK. So this is just my, my moment with respect to this distribution. And of course, here 0, this goes away. 1 to the r is just 1. So what I get is just lambda over n. Right, this is actually independent of R. No? So all the moments of my input guys are lambda over n. Okay, this is now my, <coughs> my algebraic input into my limit here. Right? So now I can just say I have random variables A and I, which are basically they are independent, and their moments are given by this, and then I'm looking on the sum, and I'm asking does this converge to anything. In the classic case I know it converges to a Poisson distribution. Uh, but actually, the level of moments is not yet so clear. And in the free case, we just replace independence by freeness and then see what we get. So, what we have to do is to do our moment calculations. Um, good. Okay, and actually, so I will now prove this. And again, we will prove classical and free at the same time, right? so that we really see uh, the parallel nature of this. And I will do it even more general. So, namely, I will consider the situation where actually uh, uh, this moment depends on R. So in this case, I have the same lambda for all R. Uh, but I could generalize this and say that actually, I mean, uh, the R moment of this A and I, they depend on R. And the crucial thing here is really that they scale with, with N as 1 over N. Uh, this is the crucial thing which gives me a limit. Uh, but I, I consider it more general. Uh, so this will give me more general limit theorems. Which you also consider it as a classic work. Oh, but it doesn't make a difference for our proof. <coughs> okay, so let, let us try yeah, calculate what we get there. Depend 
one hour. So each moment might be different. It's only the important point is that they all scale this one away. Um, okay, so this is now our assumption. Um, yeah. And so now we should check uh, what we get now uh, for such a limit here. No? So we have to calculate uh, this sum. This means we have to look on its moments in the limit and going to infinity. And of course, I want to do the free version now, but again, I do the free and the classical on the same footing, so I, I just assume that the guys are either independent or either free, and then, again, a lot of the arguments are the same until, at the end, I have to specify which situation I have to consider. Good, so let, let us try to do the calculation. If we get something meaningful, of course, then we can make a theorem out of it. Uh, so let us first do essentially the proof of the theorem. Then we see that. So what we really have at the moment might not be clear what the statement of the uh, theorem should be. So calculating of the limit distribution in this situation. Uh, okay, so, so let, let me write down again I mean, our assumptions. So consider, consider. This, of course, we are doing everything in non probability space. Uh, and yeah, I assume that I have my variables there. So and for each dimension, uh, I have n random variables. Otherwise, I would have to put more in the system. 
many places. Good. Okay, so that's our assumption. And now we want to look on the sum. Okay, we can supply this. 
p of my pi of a n a one up to a n k. But as we noticed before, and also except for the theorem, this guy here uh, depends only on the kernel. Also, if the kernel is fixed, then this is always the same uh, number, and so this only depends on pi. But of course, in this case, it also depends on n. Huh? I mean, this is a this is given by a formula in terms of the moments of the a n i's, and of course, the distribution of the a n's depends on n. In the center limit theorem, this whole dependency was in the square root of n, which we could move outside and write down explicitly. Uh, so now we have somehow dependency here. Uh, so this is now gn of i. Uh, so this is as before, as we did before for the center limit theorem. But now we should see that there is still an n dependency here. But, uh, We have, of course, to, to see how this exactly looks like. Good, okay, so... Okay, this limit is what we have to understand, 
and then we call this now. Now this just depends on time. So this is two of time. Huh? But we have to see what this is. Huh? And of course, the better should not explode. Huh? I mean, we should have chosen our scaling in the right way. Huh? I mean, in such limit theorems, you always must make a scaling, and this scaling should be made in such a way that I mean, your, your terms don't explode and that you, you keep a, a leading order. Oh, oh, bad scaling, I mean, everything goes to zero, which is not good. Another bad scaling is if things go to infinity. Uh, so it must be exactly that there is one leading order, which we have to uh, realize. Good. Okay, and now we have to see what this is. And now again, we have to distinguish the classical and the free case. Uh, because there will be a difference, as in the central material. So first of all, the classical case is again the simpler one, because there we know exactly how to calculate uh, joint moments. Then we just have factorizations for everything. Huh? Okay, so, so what, what is now? Uh, yeah. So there essentially, I mean, the behavior should be the same for all partitions. Huh? Because it, the factorization, we always have the same factorization. So for each, for each partition, yeah, so what is Tn of pi? Gn of pi is such a, a mixed moment where the pi tells me where the indices are the same and where they are different. Oh, okay. So I have here a product of independent random variables. Some of them are the same, uh, others are different. And I mean, the blocks of pi tell me exactly where I have the same variable. Okay, and of course, because they are independent, this means this guy here just factorizes into a product of the moments, which are the same. Oh, so, but, so this means for each block, I get one factor. Uh, because each block just tells me here are uh, variables which are the same. Right? And the factorization, I get just five the corresponding uh, power of how many elements I have in this block. Uh, so this means what I have here is just a factorization <coughs> into a product, one term for each block of my pi. Uh, and each contribution is just a corresponding number. So this means so for each yeah, pi, this gm of pi, Factorizes into product. Uh, yeah, and I get a term for each block. But what what is the term for block? I mean, it's the corresponding moment uh, of my variable. The moment of my variable is k r over n. Now we are is the power. But, so this means for a block, I'm just multiplying elements corresponding to the block. So this R is just uh, the number of elements in the block. No? So this means what I get here is a product where I have this kappa, and the index here is the number of elements in the block, and then I mean it's divided by n. No? So I mean all my but here and throw my moments of A and I are divided by A, scaled by A. So I get this vector here so I into a product, let's say, of factors, of these factors, and I have factors for each block. So for each block, we in my partition. Good. But then, yeah, then I get a formula. And now you see that, of course, this n to the number of blocks very nicely fits with this. No? So I, because uh, my, my contribution for the blocks are going with 1 over n, uh, and in the limit, I mean, the n should go away, so I need an n for each of the blocks. But this is exactly, uh, yeah, this is good. So 
this is, let me spell it to write down, we still have the limit, I'm summing over PKD, and then I have here a product over my blocks of pi, and for each block I get a contribution kappa, and the sub-index is the number of elements of the block, divided by n. Oh, so I have this product, this is this gn, and then I multiply this n to the number of blocks. Oh, but you see, I have here a factor 1 over n for each block, and I have a factor n here for each block. They cancel away. Oh, so in the limit, the n go away, so we have a good situation that really, I mean, this is killing was exactly the one which you need on the current basis. Oh, so what we get is not just a sum, over all partitions, and each partition makes a contribution where I'm taking the product over the blocks of my partition, and the contribution of each block is just this number kappa, and the index of kappa is now given by the number of elements. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see you get, you get a very nice formula here. Right? And maybe now you could have an idea what to expect for the free case huh? in this sense. And then let us now, again, we look at the free case, which is a bit more complicated because, I mean, the factorization rules, they are, they are rules which we understand quite well, the one for the non gaussian pies, and the other ones we don't really understand. We only have a little bit of information about them, but we have enough information for doing the arguments which we are doing. So, first of all, so we are summing here, in this formula, for all partitions, so in particular, we have the non gaussian for them, of course, the factorization of a, of a joint moment is exactly the same as for corresponding classical independent random variables. So we get for them exactly the same result as the classical case. So for non-crossing, I, so I can see of K, uh, we have a factorization as in a classical case. Uh, there we know that actually, I mean, a, a joint a mixed moment just factorizes into uh, product of moments, and we have one moment for each of the blocks. Uh, so in particular, we have again the number of blocks many terms in this uh, factorization. So we have a factorization. exactly the same as we have it here. Huh? So it's exactly this contribution. Uh, so this means the g of pi is as before the product according to the blocks of pi and the contribution of each block is just the kappa is the index number of elements of the block. Uh, so this is for a non crossing Okay. Okay, but of course the more complicated ones are the crossing ones. Uh, we are on the level of the moment in general, we don't really know how things look like. Uh, but here, we only need a little bit of information. So, so you see what is crucial here, that for the GN, I have a factorization into block many terms. No? Because, I mean, I have a factor N for each block. No? So, so, so if I get factors 1 over N here, I can balance with this uh, the number of blocks of pi many. Oh, okay, so, so if this factorizes into a product where I have the number of blocks, then I'm fine. Oh, that, that's what I have in the non crossing case, or in the classical case I have everywhere. But in the free case of the non crossings, actually, we're in a situation where our factorization is getting more complicated, and actually, it turns out that we have formulas where we have uh, more terms. Oh, we, we don't have number of blocks in terms, but we have at least number of blocks plus one many terms, which means we get too many one of many terms. Right? And this was exactly one of the assignments uh, which we have to do. Uh, that I mean, that we, we, we don't really understand the exact nature of, of uh, mixed moments for crossing partitions, but at least <clears throat> by induction, or yeah, one can show that they have a kind of specific uh, behavior. 
and they are somehow different from the ones for uh, for the again, so repeat, or so you have to write down what you were asked to do in the assignment. So for crossing pi, P of K, now, uh, so this was exercise uh, 3, from assignment 2, which we have today, so that actually this GN of pi, which is now, which is still a mixed moment in my variables, uh, but now I need uh, the kernel of these indices is crossing, and then we know that such a mixed moment uh, factorizes, or so is given by a polynomial. Uh, it's not just one term, it's not just a word of things, but it's a sum of differences of terms, so it's a polynomial in the moment, but each summit in this polynomial is a product of at least number of blocks plus one term. Okay. So, so it's given. Which are crossing. 
conditions which are not not crossing. Okay, and this means, of course, that our formula uh, here is sum of all partitions reduces to sum of our non-crossing partitions, and for the non-crossing partitions, we we know that we get exactly the same contribution as for the classical case. So what we get? by summing just for the non-crossing partitions uh, and the contribution of non-crossing partition is as in classical case the product over the blocks of pi and the factor for each block is just the cover indexed by the number of elements yeah. okay so, so maybe let me restate it Probably it's clear, but just I mean, this is a really a crucial observation. Also, so I mean, it's, if you look on the moment the crossing ones, and of course the one where we had the single crossing, we could write down uh, very explicitly. Huh? So this was five, of, let's say a one, a two. Or maybe in our case, we could, for example, be uh, a n one. A n comma two, a n comma one, a n comma two. Uh, so this would be a contribution which you would have to consider, which corresponds to the crossing one. Uh, and we know that this is given by an expression. So it's a n comma one, a n comma one times a n comma two times a n comma two uh, plus the same the other way around and minus phi of Vectors goes this one away. No? This was an assignment, it was just the point to see that whenever I have a crossing, I always have formulas like this where the number of factors here is at least one more than the number of blocks. No? So if there's really a, a somehow a conceptual difference between the formulas for the non crossing ones, where I have exactly the position into the number of blocks many terms, and the non crossing ones, where I need more. It's getting more complicated, I have the sums, but for each of the terms needs more. I mean, the only term which would only need two terms, this would be phi of a1, a n of 1 times phi of this, just a factorization. But this term is the one term which does not show up here. So we only have terms so which, yeah, which need more. Okay, so this is really a crucial one. This is maybe the only information about the general structure of the formula for mixed moments which you need for deriving uh, quite a bit of destruction. Good. So we have essentially proved now the limit theorem. And so now let me maybe write down the theorem. So we have essentially done the proof. But now we can also write down the theorem. And you already see that, of course, there's a, there's a very clear analogy between the classical uh, and the free system. So again, it's just replacing now all partitions by non-crossing partitions. In the central limit theorem, we have the same phenomena but on the level of pairwise. Running from one up to n. Okay. 
number f sine of one n. And our assumptions were that the for fixed n is variable, so this means a n one up to a n n uh, r each n uh, identically distributed. either classically or freely independent. independent. And then we also assumed that actually so we assumed the distribution of our A and I to power R was given by power R and it was scaling with N. Okay, now I want to make this now a little bit more general, but actually I mean of course that it goes with 1 over n is something which you only need as a oh, Okay, so it doesn't have to be exactly 1 over n, but just by n going to infinity, we need it to be 1 over n. Or to put it another way, n times this guy here should converge to this, oh, which means asymptotically this behaves like kappa by 1 over, one over n. Oh, so let me formulate the theorem where it is more general. Uh, version, but, but for the proof it's the same, no? it doesn't make a difference. We only needed how this behaved uh, asymptotically. Okay. So my assumption is that the limit n of infinity n times phi of a and i to the power r, this limit exists, and this kappa r. No? Which means that this here behaves asymptotically like kappa r divided by n. Uh, this should be true for all n and r. And those guys here are just uh, some convex numbers. So, guys. Good. Okay, that's our assumptions. And then the statement is so the proof is that the sum in the end row of my variable, so maybe a and one plus and so on. A and N, this converges in distribution to a random variable A. Uh, and again, without loss of generality, I also assume that this limit object lives in my in my, my algebra A. Uh, other than I can just take a bigger algebra A where I also put this. Uh, okay, so I have this, and we had a very precise formula for the distribution. Um, we showed that the limit exists by giving a very precise formula for the limit. No? First of all, of course, this shows that there exists a limit, so it converges, but we have a very precise formula of this limit, so the distribution of A is given by this formula, phi of A to the K, and then we take the sum, and of course, the difference between classical and free is whether we sum over all partitions or over drawn crossing ones. Let me first write down the classical case, summing over all partitions, and then I take the product over the blocks, and I get the product of yeah, for each block, I get the kappa is the number of elements in the block. Yeah, so this is the classical case. Um, and in the free case, we have the same formula. The only difference is that I'm now running over non crossing partitions. Uh, but uh, the contribution of them is the same as in classical of the number of blocks. Uh, okay, so this is the free case. Good. Okay, and actually, I mean, this, this is something which, which I proved uh, a long time ago, of course, this was the beginning of my career. Uh, so, this is the free case. Okay, uh, yeah, so maybe, maybe let me make a few, few remarks or a look on examples. Huh? I mean, what this formula uh, really means. And then maybe we should also look on the, on the Poisson situation. Huh? I told you we have the, the classical Poisson, huh? 
And of course, this corresponds where I put all the covers equal to one. No? So we should see what this is and also what, what the free element is. But maybe let me first make some general remarks about the formula, the structure of the formula. One question. We have, um, I mean, we have seen that the uh, convergence is in distribution, but is it, is it clear that we always find an element which has this distribution? You mean the limit? Or that there always, always exists an element somewhere that actually has yeah. this But I mean, our, our definition is very general. No? So elements are just living in some algebra and we just have a unitary linear function. No? So we just can take a free uh, algebra and just define the element there. It's more interesting to see whether we find in the star probability space positive element. No? But this is also clear somehow because, I mean, if we start here with something which is positive, then positivity goes over to the limit. No? But of course, those are things one, one should think about, and at some point we will come back to such questions. No? I mean, it's also a question, of course, uh, whether we find elements which are free. No, I am describing here, I am saying, let's have elements A and I, which have this distribution, and let them be free. So how do we know that, that there is an algebra where we find elements uh, which have this distribution and which are free? No? Of course, that's also what you do in classical probability theory. Yeah? So assume you have a sequence of independent random variables with a given distribution. So you, you should be sure that such things exist, which means you must be able to make a construction. In classical case, it's a broader measure construction. And here it will be a kind of free broader construction, which ensures that you can realize all these things. No? So freeness, if you describe the, the distribution of the individual variables, you are able to find a bigger space where you can find copies of this individual distribution and you make them all free from each other. No? No. But this, we will talk about this later. No? So, but of course, without this, if this would not be true, then those theorems would be somehow a bit uh, not, not so clear what they really mean. No? But, but if we say here, let A, this have this property, then we can be sure that there are these. Partitions of two elements, and there are two of them. Huh? So, I mean, 
and one two, no, so this is one partition, and this is one partition. I get a contribution for this, what do I get? I get a kappa, which the index is the number of blocks there, so this is kappa two. And then I get a contribution for this, and where is the contribution? I, have to, I get a program, the term factor for each block, so I get a kappa one times a kappa one. There I have five uh, partitions mm. of three elements. All of them are non-crossing, no? so it's still the same formula. Let's say that three. What is the contribution? I get a couple of three. No? So this term has one block, there's three elements, there's a couple of three. Then those blocks, I mean all of them have a block of size 2 and a block of size 1. No? So their contribution is a kappa 2 times a kappa 1. No? And they all give the same contribution, so I have 3 times kappa 2 times kappa 1. And this here gives a kappa 1 times kappa 1 times kappa 1. Okay, and then of course if k, the moment is getting bigger than 4, or equal to 4, then the formulas will be different. Okay, and maybe I think I should stop here for today.